Welcome, everyone. Good evening. My name is Sarah Odsley, and I am the Writing Across Media Facilitator at the Vermont Studio Center. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our Writer to Writer reading series with Nathan McLean and Tommy Blount. This reading series pairs two writers together with short readings of their work and then a conversation afterwards, and then a small a short Q&A will follow. Nathan McLean is the author of Scale, a recipient of fellowships from Sewanee Writers Conference, The Frost Place, Breadloaf Writers Conference, and a graduate of Warren Wilson's MFA program for writers. A Cave Canem fellow, his poems and prose have recently appeared or are forthcoming in Poetry Northwest, Green Mountains Review, Zocalo, Public Square, Poem A Day, and The Critical Flame, among others. He teaches at Hampshire College. Thanks for being here, Nathan. Tommy Blount is the author of Fantasia for the Man in Blue, the finalist for the National Book Award, and the chapbook, What Are We Not For? A Cave Canem alumnus and graduate from Warren Wilson College, he is the recipient of a fellowship from Kresge Arts in Detroit and a scholarship from Breadloaf Writers Conference. Born and raised in Detroit, Tommy now lives in the nearby suburb of Novi, Michigan. Thanks for being here, Tommy. Um, I'm so pleased to have both of you tonight. It's like my favorite thing to be able to curate this reading series and um, to invite you. So please everyone mute and enjoy. Nathan, take it away. Well, thank you, Sarah. It's, it's always strange for me to call Sarah by her first name because I've only, only called Sarah by her last name like all the time um, that I've that I've essentially known that I've essentially known Sarah but I'm, I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to uh, to have been invited and to be reading with my dear dear friend and brother Tommy Blount um, who is brilliant which most of us already know but if you if you do not you will find out very soon um, just going to be reading four poems uh, and uh, none of uh, none of them from uh, from scale. I'll be reading all material from uh, a forthcoming manuscript with with four way books. Um, and so you have now entered essentially the 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 nature portion of tonight's event. And uh, and then and then Tommy will Tommy will give us the 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 real deal. So, but thank you all for being here. And um, it's so great to see so many friendly and familiar faces and names uh, in this, in the room. Uh, it's really, really awesome. This first poem is entitled Bear. And it, and obviously for mo for many of us, I'm sure it's, there's snow everywhere, uh, lots of storms that have been coming in. Uh, and so it, it, it brought this particular poem to mind. Bear. That winter, snow, dusted the hemlock, each spiked cone. Snow salted my hair. It was that long, that winter. A black bear cub curled beside me, hers a dark honeyed sleep. If this were a fable, one could sleep the whole winter without interruption. That's how long it felt as the bear cub and I kept each other warm. She had no clamp, no shackle or trap marks in her fur. Of course, I checked. Carefully, I peeled fat gray ticks from her back, but I was gentle then. Sometimes it was my turn to wade waist deep into the river, and that was fine. If we were lucky, there were fish, though no fish would consider this luck. Sometimes the bear cub seemed to stalk a smell, sniffing. I assumed her mother, but it could have been anything that winter. You wonder what there is to learn here, other than this is not a fable. Other than whenever I woke, the bear was always a bear again. The world is full. I saw the wolf 
outside the window, in the backyard, near the park bench, nearly stripped of all its paint. Or I thought it was a wolf I saw, in so much as I even called wolf wolf through every room of the farmhouse, it was quite the spectacle. False alarm, one might say, as if explanation were a kind of comfort. I was not comforted. My panic startled me, the way one can be startled by something he's read in a book he's forgotten he owns, that he can't in the slightest remember buying while thumbing over all the other spines, all those titles huddled together there on the shelves. Out of nowhere, we say in these cases, where did this come from? How had I missed this? The wolf seemed to come out of nowhere, or maybe from a book I remember read to me as a child, some cautionary tale, a window capable of being looked in, seen through if you were brave. It was not a wolf outside the window. It was a coyote, but with a wolf's bulk, its metallic flash of fur, its appetite. I admit, I was afraid, not for myself, but for the chickens. I looked out the window because the chickens clucked so madly, like children at a school running amok. The hens flapped at the glass, the chicks instinctively slipped out of sight into the taller wet grass. No, it was not a wolf. Of course, I knew the difference. I had been a boy, been small enough to be clenched in a wolf's jaw, though I never was. I was safe. I wanted to save them, but the commercial in the background insisted the window for savings was closing fast, then faded to black, as they do when they're done. The wolf scattered them, the way feathers can be scattered, torn from the body, or the way children are drilled even in grade school to scatter. Shh. We prepared for this now. I called Wolf. I clapped at the glass, which I've been told makes a difference, and I wanted things to be different. To the chickens, it must have looked as if I took delight in their predicament. And who would tell them otherwise? The world is full of suffering. It's true. Why not delight in that it's yours, not mine, for once? The wolf slunk away, or the, or, the, or the coyote slunk away, or the wolf did, something dead, I thought, between its teeth. I was afraid, though I went out to look for what was missing, what was lost to the woods. Ten chickens, two chicks. I counted them, like I tally all loss what was scattered the way one might scatter bird seed in the yard, or how one might scatter a child's ashes to the ocean's indifference. I had been a boy, lost among the woods as in some fable, or maybe not lost, just a shade of tree bark. Not a wolf, though to the chickens, the distinction hardly matters. Here, Chicky Chicky, no one had bothered to name them. To name them, we believed, would make them harder to kill and eat, but how wrong we were. I believed I could save them, or that saving them meant I loved them, that my love was good for something. The flowers. The flowers in the greenhouse, now flowers in the supermarket, rubber bound, clipped from wherever, they seemed almost to nod their agreement with what the breeze once said. Now flowers in some glass case on the dining room table where no one eats. What race they are, doesn't matter, nor 
if their stems are thorny, you see. They're just flowers. They die. You walk by them all the time, hardly thinking twice about their names. And I'm going to close with this uh, a longer poem as well, entitled What You Call It. And uh, I thank you so much, all of you, for being here, for your attentiveness. Uh, and I'm excited to hear uh, from Tommy Blount uh, shortly after this. What You Call It. Not my usual route to the market, past the railroad tracks, then pass Grace Episcopal Church, its, its courtyard empty. No men clasping hands as though agreeing finally to the difficult terms of some treaty. So I would not have known it was a peach tree unless the person who planted it or someone on the street told me. Which is not to say its fruit didn't look peach-like. It did. Rather, I didn't read it as such, didn't know what I was seeing really. From where I stood, the fruit perfect and young and heavy, at least heavy enough to bow the branches. Ripe, one might say, which, true, is more precise, precision a thing of value. Not that the fruit cares what you call it, or stands for anything other than what, can, what time can make of some small human intervention, is no piece of literature. The peach was simply a peach, and there for the taking, which is often said of an object that has gone unwatched for too long, susceptible to trespass, which happens first in the mind and happened first because of fruit, or so says the good book, if you believe in such things. Knowledge, which a poet once called historical, too, a trespassing of sorts, the proof of which perhaps best shown in how one might punish a slave who had been taught to read the word beauty or toil or rest secretly and by firelight. There are things nearly impossible to forget, having so trespassed, having badly needed to see up close the tree fixed in place, its fruit dangling, there within reach, though not the same as being offered. Tenderness, I have learned, is only one test of whether some fruit has fully ripened. You press the flesh, right here. But for me, that would mean crossing half the yard, the way a paper boat might be pushed by wind across a pond. Thank you very much. That was glorious, Nathan. Yeah, I hear, I hear certain people in this virtual room have read this uh, mention, this said, uh, new book, not me. No, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, let me make sure I time myself. Okay, I'm going to read, I'm just going to keep reading for 15 minutes and then I'll, yeah. That's the plan. So I'm going to read um, a poem that's not in the book. It's not a new poem because I'm not writing. Um, but it's a poem that somehow made it into the world. It's going to be in Gulf Coast. Um, and it's my contrapuntal that I wrote after um, <clears throat> the... Um, Oh shoot, I should have shown it. The loud, there's a, there, okay, so there's a, a photograph, or there's a photograph series um, called Brotherhood, Crossroads, et cetera, by um, Lyle Ashton Harris and um, his brother, Thomas Allen Harris. And 
in most of them, they're, um, they appear together and they're usually naked, um, in drag and they're like always in like, um, an intimate embrace. And in this one photograph, they are, um, they are, they're kissing but one of them is holding a gun to the other one at the same time. And so I wrote this contrapuntal. Um, yeah, yeah, that's what we'll call it. Brotherhood, Crossroads, and et cetera. Number two, 1994. At his gun's insistence, my jaw goes slack. Call it a kiss. If this isn't love, then I will, willing to cross the distance, earn his favor. Afraid to let go, I lean into his body's bleak weapon. Why not trust this dark tunnel's burrow across the hate-wide distance between us? Yes, trust in my brother, God of this small destruction, for his aim is my aim, his arm, my arm. We can steady the gun's bright kiss of hello. It tickles me, but I'm too afraid to laugh and break this embrace. I do not like his body when it is seen for my body. And now, this accomplice, another death hard brother, illegitimate sibling, silenced against me, muzzle to milk hollow tit. Oh, do I not long for my brother's hand in love of what came before this rage? Do I not love my brother enough to kill him before another brother can? I, wouldn't I, favor him if I were not ready to die by the hands of my brother's arms? No, I don't want to see what comes next. It's my mouth, not my eyes, I open as if to sing, trust in my brother, God of this small destruction, for his aim is my aim, his arm, my arm. We can steady the note low as the number of fingers it takes to tickle a bullet free. Why be afraid? Let him go. Don't I believe in this dark tunnel burrowing across the distance between us? My tongue busy with his tongue. I'm a quiet hostage who's given up. The gun holds my finger in its small O of betrothal, wedded in love of what came before this bothered blood. At his gun's insistence, my jaw goes slack. Do I not love my brother enough to call it a kiss? If this isn't love, then I will kill him before another brother can, willing to cross the distance, earn his favor. Afraid I, wouldn't I, favor him if I were not ready to let go. I lean into his body's bleak weapon to die by the hands of my brother's arms. Why not trust this dark tunnel's burrow across? No, I don't want to see what comes next, the hate-wide distance between us. Yes, it's my mouth, not my eyes. I open as if to sing, trust in my brother, God of this small destruction, for his aim is my aim, his arm, my arm. We can steady the gun's bright kiss of hello, the note low as the number of fingers it takes to tickle. It tickles me, but I'm too afraid to laugh a bullet free. Why be afraid and break this embrace? Let him go, don't I believe? I do not like his body when it is seen in this dark tunnel burrowing across the distance from my body. And now this accomplice between us, my tongue busy with his tongue. I'm another death hard brother, illegitimate sibling, silenced, a quiet hostage who's given up against me, muzzle to milk hollow tit. The gun holds my finger in its small O. Oh, do I not belong, do I not long for my brother's hand of betrothal? wedded in love of what came before this rage, this bothered blood. I had to downsize my, my um, mason jar because I was being teased by people because my other mason jar apparently was too big and distracting. Yeah, so there. 
Um, all right. Oh, okay. How long are we reading for? 15 minutes? Okay. 10, 10 to 15. 10, okay. Well, Nathan did 15, so I'm gonna do 15. I don't care. Um, well, since I'm talking about uh, brotherhoods and brother, I'll read Blood Harmony. Um, oh no, I'll read Phonophobia. Uh, um, yeah, I don't want to say anything about this poem except for phonophobia. So phonophobia is actually um, a fear that I have, which is like a you know a sudden loud noises like a balloon burst or firecrackers. Um, it probably won't help you to understand the poem. But it, it will in some cases, so in, in, in one kind of way or another. Body cam footage, the crackle and chirp of it anyway. I'm within earshot. I know what is about to happen again. Click the news windows site, uh, cl click the news site's window closed. Open my window to geese barking a path across the man-made pond. The pond plopped near a quiet suburban lane. One flops over, pops up with a spray of grass in its beak. It turns its bearded head away to the road's new pitch. An ice cream truck blares the white noise of an old American song. The tune whips the air in my mouth into vanilla soft serve. Once, back in Detroit, my brother sent me out to shout for for the Mr. Softy truck, two cones. So I said, little brother, where's the other cone? You should have two. He always starts. And upon hearing the beat, I chime in with. So then I said, I had two, but yours went splat on the ground. I just started slurping away on the other cone. None of this ever truly rings a bell for me. I never remember yet want to remember. So I rattle off the learned script so that he can laugh. Then I can laugh harder, which makes him laugh even harder until we both bark and crack up with tears streaming down our faces. We are so happy then, the guffaws, the chuckles, just one big snicker. We can't stop laughing. We laugh until we can't breathe. You think we are dying. Uh, I will end with Blood Harmony and then, that'll, and then that'll be that. Cause my contacts are failing me and I can't see. Um, yeah, no background. Okay. This will be anything but beautiful Blade buried in us bloodshed, or rather the need for it in all the ways we, I'm told, should crave love too. To loathe, heir of my father's blood, is the matter of sentience. I know I am meant to love you, yet can the salt of our blood serum be the elixir to break this fever of rage, this kissing of fists? Are we not at war over my body, its dominion, which men may stroke my arm and which cannot? Here is my mouth. Give me the sweet ache of your knuckles. Let's unravel our mouths in the most dangerous song of fraternity. Fill our ears with nothing except each other, with scales for which our bodies together are the only capable instrument a fine instrument of brutality, a double-minded man of muscled rage, reluctant tenderness. 
We dance around that which we are only brave enough to signal with our blades short and bright lyric. Skilled as we are in the blood bother of this evasion, we mean only to stifle the air of one another momentarily to be sensed as if we matter to the other, to be reviled only to be revealed at last, relieved of this anger's load. Now we have locked hands, joined is your right to my left. Do we mean, do we mean to harm with this one fist? It kisses no mouth. It promises only to break open our desire to be touched and consoled in a way only a brother's hand can. Brought here by the blood deed of brothers, I can't turn away in cowardice or shame from your need to point, from your need to prove the point of your blade sentiment for a body's revision. You and your consort, this sharp tongued brother, mean to break me, lay me down with its lipless kiss into the brother you wish you'd inherited. By the blade's argument, I am to be nobody or a new body, a new brother pulled from harm's kiln. Isn't that the glory of wounds and the breakage of bones? Their eagerness, I mean, to heal. What has harmed before becomes a science of fear the body postured awkwardly in its attempt to avoid the same old errors, old behaviors. Go on then, school me on what blood is for, yet know my blade too has its claims on your body's hagiography. Now it wants to question a tree down your face to mark your beauty. At the center of love, is always buried a blade's head. And then I will stop there. Oh my goodness, I can't see Nathan. My <laughs> eyes are failing me. Thank you both. Um, I wanted to invite everyone to unmute for just one quick second and give both of our readers a round of applause or a hoot and a holler if you, however you feel like exclaiming your appreciation. <laughs> yeah. Um. Awesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, so this is, yeah, yeah. Um, so I wear the contacts so that the ring light doesn't reflect off my glasses. But I think I'm gonna have to start saying fuck that and wear my glasses because contacts are always dry out, especially when I do readings after seven o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tommy, before you hopped on, Nathan and I were talking yeah, about the yeah. glass glare. I've given and, up, Tommy. I've given and, and I don't wear contacts anyway. So yeah. And you and you know they they you know they sold me on the the whole um well these lenses you can get them coated with and you know, anti-reflective. <laughs> That's how they get you. I just, if, if they were, right. if the optometrist right, tries to put <laughs> the contact into my eye, which I've only had, I've had it done once. And I was like, I hope this dissolves because you are not getting this back. <laughs> and, and I'm going to be blind in the other eye because no, they had to hold me down, Tommy. Oh gosh. But so th nice that was that. that was an incredible, incredible reading. I love love those poems. I want to okay. Since you since you haven't let me uh, read the book, <laughs> I mm -hmm. I want to know what's 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 uh, what, uh, yeah. Because um, the only poems I've read are the um, the they said I was an alternate poems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm which are phenomenal. Um, yeah, I'm like blown away every time I see one and they're not punctuated. No. Like you're, was, you're not, yeah. Which was a surprise, which was actually a surprise for me too. I was, um, it was, as I started writing, I thought it was gonna be one poem, Tommy. I thought that mm -hmm. that was gonna be one poem. Yeah. And I realized that everything I wanted to deal with, and I, it started off as a, as just this very long 
this very long thing. And uh -huh. I realized that I wasn't able, I wasn't going to be able to, to, to make the kinds of pivots that I felt like I needed to make unless I, unless I broke it down. Uh -huh. And, um, and so, but I, I would, I would say like, I mean, this, 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 this particular book is baffling me and um, like, it's a, uh, yeah. Well, I can't wait to, yeah. <laughs> it is baffling me. I know that it has, I, there's a lot that has to do with thinking about, uh, well, I, I would say I had a, a piece of, a, a piece of paper that was taped into uh, a notebook that is, or, or one of those middle of folders that has since kind of fallen apart. Mm -hmm. um, and I still remember it as I was writing those alternate poems and still not quite figuring out. I knew that I was writing them and that they had something to do with this new material mm -hmm. and, um, and the new direction of this, in the direction of this book. Um, and it was around the time that there was a number of states that were passing all of the, a number of states were passing all of these anti-abortion laws. Mm -hmm. So we were seeing them like coming up in, you know, in Alabama and then, you know, and, and then in Missouri, like and we're seeing them just starting to happen everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and of course there's all of this rationale and reasoning for, for that. Uh, and I, I, I wrote because as, as, as many may know, I'm in an, an, you know, an inter, interracial marriage. And so one of the things I wrote down and I taped into my notebook and I, I felt like this was when I had a sense of what this book ultimately was going to be interested in was I wrote down um, that even if, even if my, my child uh, is, is legally mandated to be brought to full term, mm -hmm that in no way guarantees them a life. Mm. And I, I just held, held that as a, in, in this notebook and is, is, uh, is still there. And I, and I knew that that was what I was writing towards. I wasn't entirely sure how I was going to get there. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm still in the midst of, of, of course, as, as you know, having, having recently gone through the process and in the editorial phase of it. Oh, now. I never know what I'm doing. <laughs> I never know. Well, that's why, that's why, that's why, okay, so that's why I'm going to be candid here, Sarah. Um, that's <laughs> me, why, me too. <laughs> that's why, that's um, why, yeah, that's why Q&As and like conversations freak me out because, <laughs> well, one of the reasons, because I have a bunch of, you know, uh, freak out things, <laughs> but like, I'm terrible at like retracing my poems and how I, and how I, and, and like, I can, I mean, I can give like a, a I can like think of roughly how I got to it, but like specific things. And I think it's because, I think it's because it's, it, yeah, it's why I'm seeing, it's why I'm in therapy too. I think it's because, um, I lack, I lack um, foresight, I think. Like I can't see, I can see into, I can see into the future, but I can't see too far into the future. Mm. I don't know why I can't. Mm. And so when I'm like writing, I'm like in that moment. And then I'm like, okay, this, this draft. Okay. Then I'm going to, and I'm moving forward with this one, you know? And, um, and I think I told you too, like in the book, I have uh there's some there's some poems in the book that have like um they have like a, a scaffolding to them. Mm -hmm. Um like Blood Harmony. It started out uh was I in the grind with you when I was I don't know if I was in the grind with you when I was writing Blood Harmony. I know that I, I was in it. I was definitely in one of them with yeah. you. Yeah. I was writing because yeah. they were because they were like they were just like little chunks. Mm -hmm. And I wrote every day they were little chunks. And um, and then they sat for a while, like a lot of my writing just sat for a while. And I was like, I don't want anybody seeing this. This is hideous. <laughs> and then um, and then I think I had the idea to like fiddle around with sonnets. I was like, okay, let's see if, what will happen if I put them in a little, a little, make a little crown of sonnets or something. <laughs> um, that didn't work out. But then like, um, 
there were like words that I kept like, um, that I kept gravitating towards. And I was like, okay, let me see what I can do um, mm -hmm. with, you know, with these words. Um, and then of course it was the, you know, the, the movie, I had seen um, Corel too. So I was obsessed with the movie Corel, yeah. yeah. And, um, and so, and so I kept having that in my mind and I, that, that scene in my mind, I was like, okay. Um, yeah. And then like, I lose track of it after that point. Um, but like the poem actually has like a repetition of certain words mm -hmm. and they like repeat, they repeat in, um, <clears throat> in, uh, in different phrases. So like brotherhood and right. fatherhood, and then there's like, um, uh, low love, um, uh, there's like this little loose scaffolding, right? So that there's this like dance in the poem too. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's like a, you know, there's many poems in the book where, cause this book has taken me so long to write. So there's like, you know, there's, there's many poems in the book that, that, um, <laughs> that I'm like a, I'm like an old man who likes puts things, <laughs> who like stows money in places and then goes, oh, there it yeah. is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But maybe I think, but I'm glad you you brought that up though, Tommy, because one of the questions, and maybe this will actually enlarge on something, a question that I think that Luke had in the, in the chat that was asking about your your use of the contrapuntal. I don't know that how many people would call you a formalist. I would call you a formalist, absolutely. What? And oh, yeah. yeah, I would. Yeah, I would absolutely call you a formalist. And I'm I always want to talk with you about form because you utilize you utilize form. I think more effectively than I think than than many uh, contemporary poets. I mean, I think that your poems are like shining examples of really form and content actually really like one enacting the other. And whether it's you utilizing the ekphrastic mode or if you utilizing a triptych that is somehow, um, you know, that somehow dis that you've unthreaded and unspooled in some way or utilizing the sonnet um, and, and yeah, and yeah, as, as Luke says, Philip, of course, is also in that in that league. And I'm glad that Philip is here as well. Philip is fantastic. You, now, yeah. I have a call Philip a form. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Philip's absolutely a formalist. But would you would you talk a little bit about your obsession with form? In terms oh, of form? God. Oh, <laughs> Lord. Um. Uh, the truth is I'm very good at failing at form. <laughs> so like, so, you know, so like in, like in my chat book, I have the, the one poem. Um, um, oh goodness. I can't even remember the names of my poems. It's the one named after the, the Bishop. It's the one I use uh, Bishop as like, a, it's like a, Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, a yeah. Odd, it's like a odd, it's not even a golden shovel, but it's like a hyperextended, I call it a hyperextended villanelle uh, golden shovel. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's because I failed at it. And I was like, okay, well, you know, um, well, this frame doesn't work for me. So I'm going to make it work for me and mm -hmm. make it work for what's happening in the poem, what the poem wants. Um, and so for me, like, that kind of formal question of like, you know, approaching these sort of received forms, like, thank you, you know, um, and that and like, even like um, ekphrastic, uh, the ekphrastic work, I'm always trying to, there's two, there's two answers to this, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> I always, so like, I'm always trying to figure out how to, um, make room for myself in that frame, whatever that frame is, trying to um, where I wasn't, trying to make room for a space where I probably wasn't supposed to be, mm -hmm. or I probably, you know, they never saw me coming or, um, um, or I wasn't intended to be in, in that, in that space. I always equate it to, um, um, Audra McDonald, who's my favorite uh, performer, and she's my favorite singer and actor and everything, and I love her. Um, mm -hmm. And 
I equate it with, uh, I, you know, I compare it to her because, you know, um, she, you know, she, you know, she's got like six or seven Tonys and, but like in her younger years, like her whole thing was like starring in these, roles that were written for like white women and then she came in and like people never saw it like they couldn't see anybody else except Audra doing that role and stuff you know what I'm saying um and so it's that same kind of thing you know um so there's that and then there's um my obsession with like um revisioning like I like to to um when I read with Nandi, Nandi called it, she, she said it was like a deep, I, like I look deeply at things. I, I see it as me looking at something and looking at it again and again and like recasting and reshaping. I'm watching WandaVision. <laughs> I haven't on started Disney. it, but it looks, but it so, looks really good. On WandaVision, it's doing, the, it's doing the thing that I'm talking about where like every episode, it's like, it's being like, it's the, it's the, it's the same sort of, it's the same cast of characters, but like the scene gets changed or like, the, you know, the, it just keeps getting revised over and over again. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, that's another reason why I like going into forms and um, what Tarfia told me, uh, uh, jailbreaking uh, poems, I mean, forms, um, is because I like to, fiddle around with them. I think it be, I think it's because I used to like playing with Legos too. And I was little, <laughs> you know how you would put them, you know, put them mm -hmm. together. And then you can Yeah, like, we never we, we never had the the like I never we never had the box that showed you what you were supposed to make. Yeah. Legos. So you just made whatever you can think of. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. <laughs> um yeah. Uh yeah. And was there a, a particular reason, like for the contrapuntal in particular, which is a hard form? Um, like, I mean, like okay, all, so, I mean, all form is hard, but that yeah. one. <laughs> so this goes to another. This goes to another philosophy of mine about how I approach poems, and um, I'm thinking that like poetry professors are probably, you know, frowning their faces at me and and furrowing their eyebrows when they hear this. But I like, but I like to, I mean, I love, I love, clearly, I love um, borrowing from other poems, mm -hmm. but really what gets me off is like stealing from like other disciplines and other um, mm -hmm. art forms. So when I'm like, so when I'm approaching an ekphrastic or, you know, ekphrastic poem, um, I'm not necessarily interested in describing it, as, although that probably is part of it, but I'm always interested in like taking, the, lifting the technique from that painting or photograph. Um, like with um, uh, the painting that's on the cover of my book, mm -hmm. Portrait of Christopher D. Fisher for Thrice Skinhead by Pierre Williams. Oh my love, I love Peter Williams' work. I just love him. Um, but that painting has like um, it's it's sitting in different time frames. Mm -hmm. um, one, it's a it's a mugshot for one. It's actually a mugshot. Um, so there's that, um, and it sits in the past. So there's like all of this like Jim Crow iconography in there. There's like blackface going on in there. Um, and then there's like these European flourishes that are in the painting too. And there's like a, a little cherub and everything, you know, um, and, um, and then, and then there's the, the, the mugshot and the, the figure and, uh, the time period that that figure brings up, you know, he was a, um, Christopher F uh, Fisher was trying to, um, start a race, a race war, um, around the, you know, the Rodney King beating the LA riots. He was trying to start a, a race war by bombing a church. Um, so there was that. And then there was like this other, this other um, sort of time frame, which was like the present moment, which was me coming to the painting with mm -hmm. all of my stuff, um, 
you know, me coming as a black gay man with all of my stuff, right? Um, and, and my relationship to race and how complicated that is. Um, uh, and how I have used, and how I have um, subjected my body to white men or like, mm -hmm. um, in many ways, right? Mm -hmm. um, not just sexually, but like, you know, um, in a sort of systematic sense too. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's why that poem is, is layered and weaved and tied in like that because the painting is doing that same thing. So with the contrapunto, um, you have these two, you know, you have the two brothers and you also have this dichotomy of like lovers and um, lovers and, and, um, and foes, mm -hmm. just an obsession of mine with brotherhoods, as you can hear with yeah. you know, the two poems, the contrapuntal and then our, you know, blood harmony, um, which are pretty close cousins. Um, yeah, so okay. the contrapuntal for me, it, it allowed me to um, get that, uh, that, that paradox for me, it's, it's, you know, it's another way of getting paradox in there. Um, yeah. And, um, and creating a kind of faux resolution um, with that third voice. Um, yes. Yeah, it's not like a, it's a, it's not really a resolution, uh, even though there's a marriage that happens in the poem, but it's not really a marriage, you know. um, yeah. yeah. I think that's what I love really about reading your poems, particularly the ones that utilize fixed or received forms is that they're, they're, they're so sly and they're so tricky and I love the fact that you you provide us with something that on the surface looks as though it resolves. It resolves harmonically. It resolves in the, you know as in terms of its formal gestures. It resolves in terms of what we expect of the form. But yet we know that what is being dealt with within the poem absolutely doesn't resolve. And that's mm -hmm. the thing that that sort of tension seems to create like the resonance. I think for. Yeah. Yeah, with within those poems, um, you know, with any of the sonnets that you that you write, like this this conflict of brotherhood, or um, or writing, you know, a ballad, uh, or you know, or writing this this triptych that that is only delineated by space, um, you know, and you interweave all of this, all you interweave and and sort of untangle all this time within it. Which, for if any if any of you have it, haven't haven't uh, been able to read. I, I wrote a review of Tommy's book uh, early on. It was very lovely, Nathan. That was very. I appreciate wonderful. that. I, I, I they gave me a word count. I would have written for pages more, Tommy, and I exceeded the word count. <laughs> I said he he wrote that because he's my friend. No. <laughs> <laughs> they were like, "Give us a thousand words," and I was like, "I can't do it." <laughs> it was like I cannot do it. Um, and, but I could have written about that just, I could have written solely about that triptych. I mean, My God, Lick Him Clean is such a tremendous I, poem. And, I and just, want, yeah, I mean, yeah, just the fact that you went, well, and is there a point where you, where you sort of like, sort of finally discover that something wants to be in, in a form? Like how many drafts yes. is it? Are you, are you? Like working with so the you're asking to me to do, so you're asking me to do the forensics thing again. I am turn the black light um, on the Tommy. So that one, so that poem, um, that was the fastest. That was a fast poem. Like that, that was my like the fastest poem I've ever written. And you, were um, you were commissioned to write that one too. Yeah, right? yeah, and um, yeah, there were a few drafts of that one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, at least 15. Cause I would like go to that. Cause I, I would like, um, and again, this was like the fast, that was like the fastest I've written a poem. Um, yeah, I'm praying pretty quick. Okay. Um, so I wanted to, I know you're probably, you've moved on from scale. No, I, I mean, I still, I, I still love this book. Because I, was... I love scale. <laughs> and I, you know, I was on your thesis committee and I loved it then. Yes. 
Um, you, you, I think you were among the ones that that fought for fought for keeping it that title because yes. I think there were others who, yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Were um, different. And what I what what one of the things? Okay, so like I always talk about, um, I am a fan of. Um, I'm a fan of when poets, when they craft images that feed back into the poem, that don't that that that, that sort of don't just sit there in the um, in in what I call it the um, um, like they're just there, like they're pretty, and then they go, okay, that's surprising, okay, whatever, and then they don't do anything with it. With your poems, though. Um, Cause I was um, one of the, you know, I think about your poems when I, when I, when I'm saying that it's you, it's Bridget P. and Kelly, it's Eduardo Corral. Um, I'm thinking of Eduardo's, um, oh God, what's that poem? And it's in Slow Lightning. Um, but it's the poem where, uh, oh shoot, I can't believe I forgot the name of it, but it's the poem where the, um, <laughs> where it's a moon and then and then the moon is like plucked out of the sky and it turns into a blindfold and then the blindfold is put on but then there's a scene inside of the blindfold <laughs> so the poem you know so that the yeah. image sort of feeds back into the poem um Carrie Marr who's in here I'm gonna point yeah. her out too she does this in special education too mm-hmm. and you do it you know you but you use image in a way that um that sort of lets um, that lets us into the psychology of um, of the speaker. I'm thinking of um, this this image. It just blew me away. Um, in the short age, it's the first section, mm-hmm. and it's of the it's of the well. You, the poem refers to him as a man, but I pres- I assumed it was it was a father. But he's sort of outstretched between. Um, the slide and the, the rock wall and he's trying to hope he's trying to you know keep the world intact keep his you know keep everything intact yet he's shaped like scissors which mm. is which is an object of severance which is something that which is which is something that the book um has associated with like a father and mm. so there's like this complicatedness there's you know uh here is this this object that is that is in this in this sort of situation it's intact but in the speaker's mind it's a it's scissors um and then what was the other one? Oh, and of course my favorite and use camaro the oh. um the the crumbling cake and the the sinking balloons mm. so i guess i just want to know um yeah and the, the new poems i wrote so much down uh so <laughs> I just want to hear you talk about image, like how you approach image, I guess. Yeah. Because yeah, I feel that's... like I don't know what I'm doing. So I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, oh, I want you to talk yeah, well, about. Well, first of all, I'm going to say that is false. Uh, I just want to. I... <laughs> you don't know what you're doing. And hi, Francine. Glad Franci- Franny could make it. Um... <laughs> Francine, my, my mason jar is not, it's, it's, it's downsized. Yeah, just you for were you. Call, you were called out as <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, <it's> not me. <laughs> I brought I brought it I brought my own jug for you Tommy. See? Yes. <laughs> and and Tommy, I will I, I have to say you in terms of in terms of image, like there's you're among I think the poets I most admire who use who use image in such a striking yeah. fashion. I, don't I think you know yeah. what I'm doing. I'd be making mistakes. And I, just, I think know, about and poems embracing like, the mistakes. Yeah. That's all I do. Poems I go, like the oh, black umbrella. I gotta keep you, you know, yeah. <laughs> going with the mistakes, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that re-seeing I think is 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 super important. Okay. When um I'm I, and as I, I appreciate what you were you were saying about that, Tommy. And, and any of any of the I have a there's a couple of of former students of mine who are in the space as well, and they can tell you like I am militant when it comes to thinking through the precision of images. Mm-hmm. Um, 
in particular because I feel as though that's that's a, the way that you've described it is exactly the way that I think about it when I'm going into the poem. Like how how does how does this framing um, end up? And I and I I think I've explained it this way in in certain classes. I was at I was at Cave Canem. I think it was maybe my second um, my second summer at Cave Canem, and I was BC, working CC. And um, I was working with uh, with Chris Abani, I think, in a, in a workshop. Who is brilliant, by the way, who is who is absolutely brilliant. And we were talking about photography, and um, you know, because uh, he does photo essays as well. And I ended up interviewing him and 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 uh, for forward review when I was still editing there. And one of the things that he said that has stuck with me for a long time. He see he see because and. I learned this when I ended up buying an expensive camera, uh, which I like almost immediately had stolen from me. And I, I think the thief was doing me a favor because they just knew that I just wasn't, you know, I wasn't gonna do that, do right by that camera. But uh, but he, one of the things that he taught me was that he was like, he, he says, this is gonna sound simple, but a camera, uh, regardless of how expensive it, it, it may be, is, is simply mechanical. You know, he says that a camera doesn't a camera doesn't see what you see. A camera only sees what's in front of it. And so he he was he was saying that that the to at least to think through this idea that the poet's job is not only to learn to learn how to see, but also to frame what you see in a way that your that your reader or your viewer it can can see what the camera sees. Mm -hmm. And I think about that when it comes to image, I think about that in relationship to the way in which that's able to help frame the poem mm -hmm. um, and, to, and to drop even the most subtle of hints into, and I'm always wanting to think about what does this reveal about my speakers and my speakers, you know, psychology. I, I think I, I, it was it was drilled into me from Martha Rhodes constantly who, who who is your editor as well, Martha Rose, she constantly asking the me the question. Queen of doing that. Yeah, constantly asking the question: Where is your reader now? Where she, is your reader now? Yeah. What does what does your reader know about this speaker now? Then what do they understand? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's my shit. That's yeah. My where is your reader now? Um, and so that's when I when I'm constructing an image, uh, and it's also you know, and, and also thinking about you know, is this, does this image, is this image going to recur in some way? Does it have some importance um, to, uh, and, it, and I think it's also different, like uh, I would imagine that we, as we think about it now, the individual poem, and then thinking about how things get revised when they are part of the larger yeah. collection, mm -hmm. um, because yeah. I found that there were some things, uh, for instance, in the poem that you mentioned, The Short Age, um, that third poem that's talking about the the going to Walmart and and buying the the self assembly the self assembly grill um, and putting it together. There actually was originally there was no dog in that section, but because it ends up being in the earlier section of the book, you said there is no dog. There was no dog. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. There was no dog in that section, but because it ends up showing up in these other ways that's threaded through the book, uh, it felt important to sort of like have it there as well. And especially because of the next section leads into like the section with the dog that loses, um, loses her puppies. And uh, yeah, and so when I think of, I'm, I'm, I try to be as yeah. deliberate as possible when thinking with, with image, but I don't. I don't do the thing that you do, where you take the tenor and it becomes a vehicle, <laughs> and then the vehicle that. becomes the tenor. I and love then, it. I yeah. I mean, tracking your images has been like that. Is a it ends up being incredibly <laughs> rewarding as like as I try as I pull apart. I love it. I your, love it. It's so fun. It's so yeah. fun. And, and you do it. <laughs> it's. I think it's. Um, um, the way I, the way I have described that madness to myself, <laughs> um, um, it's my, it's my cinematic mind at work. Mm -hmm. I think my love of film, um, and, uh, um, 
I'm supposed to be giving a master class on like I'm giving a master class on poetry and movies. Um, when where 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 is, where is the sign up? It's secret. It's it's <laughs> it's not for the public. It's secret, and it's probably for the best. <laughs>